Well, I think this year is going to be one of the things that people are going to talk about. It's the year that, that uh, forever changed not just our country, but our planet. Mm -hmm. And I cannot help but feel that God's working things out and getting everything ready for the end time. And I really believe that. Now, as we face these changes, it is imperative that we do so from a foundation of faith. One of the things that, that I, I sense today is a lot of people are losing faith. A lot of people are not understanding uh, what's going on, and a lot of people are concerned. You know, we need a foundation on which to stand, a foundation on which to build, and a foundation on which to fight the good fight of faith. Uh, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. We need to understand there's no other foundation than Jesus Christ. Our life must be built on him. Uh, the Bible says in Psalms 11 verse 3, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And one of the things that I sense today in so many lives is they've lost that foundation. They've lost that thing on which to build. They've lost that, that, that foundation of faith. Now we need as a mission statement to keep us focused uh, on, the, on the philosophy of life by which to govern our lives as we go through the days and the years ahead. That is the foundation we're looking for. And, and so our theme as a church, and hopefully as members of the, of the local New Testament Baptist church, is this theme, so much the more. Uh, you know, our message will be, so much the more. Our motto will be, so much the more. Our mission statement will be, so much the more. Now, lest we see it as simply a marketing strategy or a cute motto uh, for another year, let's consider the fact that that phrase, and so much the more, is a command of God. We find it in the Word of God. It's attached to other commandments to be obeyed. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more so you see the day approaching. Now, usually when this verse is read, everybody uses it to go into church. Well, you're commanded to go to church. We're not supposed to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But this command is in a context in which messages will be focused. Uh, it is the context that gives it teeth, that gives it purpose, and gives its importance. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to look at its context uh, before we consider the command. And so we're going to look at today the foundation of the command. Why is it we need to do so much the more? What is it about this command and what is it built on? And so let me say it is about man in his sin and God in his holiness. Uh, if you want to turn, I've got the, the passages uh, printed out up here, but Genesis chapter 3 uh, verses 1 through 7 takes us all the way back to the very beginning of this principle. Genesis 3 verse 1 says it began in, or, uh, it says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Uh, we need to understand the story of this message today goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. All the way back to that day that Eve looked at the tree and saw that it was good for food and desired to make one wise. And in spite of what God said, she ate of it. And then she gave to her husband and in his rebellion, he ate it as well. Now the Bible tells us, starting in verse 22 of Genesis 3, And the Lord God said, 
Behold, man is become as one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat, the, and, and, eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden uh, to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed at the east end of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Thus began the separation of God and man. And we need to understand that our, our passage in Hebrews chapter 10 deals with that separation. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 18 verse number 4 says, Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. God makes a statement to Ezekiel, and that statement is this, I own every soul. Your soul's not yours. You know, a lot of times we get this idea, well, it's my life. No, it's not. God's the one that gave you life. God's the one that can take your life. And God's saying this, you belong to him. He has authority over you. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Now, we may not like it. A lot of people don't like it, but understand God's will, God's plan, God's determination, God's judgment is this. The wages of sin is death. Uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Then shall he say un also unto them that are on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Listen, God has a place prepared for judgment. Amen. And that place is called hell. Yeah. And even though you don't hear it preached a whole lot anymore, it is a real place where real people go and suffer a real eternity, a real torment forever. And then we find in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it from, whom, uh, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered uh, up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is a second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So we realize that this message uh, that we're going to be looking at, this theme that we're going to be looking at, has its foundation all the way back in the Garden of Eden when man sinned and thus began the separation of man from God and God from man. Now that principle is presented here in Hebrews. Let me tell you what we find here in the book of Hebrews. We find God dealing with that separation. We find God making it possible for man to be able to approach God and for God to be able to deal with man. And, and, and so we see this presented here in Hebrews and this is what really the whole message is about there. It's about the, the, the separation. It's about man in his sin and God in his holiness. And then it's also about God's plan to redeem or to buy back mankind, to provide a sacrifice for man. See, God looked at man and God's not content that it stay this way. God was not content to let man alone and let him die and go into eternity. God wanted to provide a way for man to escape hell fire for man to escape separation from God for God wanted to make a way so that man could come to him Amen. and that's what we have presented here and so it's about God's plan to redeem mankind. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 17 says, Wherefore, as by one man sinned and entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was, uh, uh, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one uh, many be dead, 
uh, much more the grace of God and the great and the gift of grace, which is by one man Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many, and not as it were by one that sinned, so is the gift for judgment uh, was to the one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses and a justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. What's talking about is simply this. Because of Adam, we're all sinners. Amen. Amen. But because of Jesus Christ, we can become saints. Amen. And that's what we have here. What we have here is God's plan. God looking at man and seeing man separated from him and, and God could not just overlook sin. His holiness will not allow that. Sin must be paid for. The holiness of God and the truth of God demands that the wages of sin is death. But God designed a plan whereby sins could be paid for and redemption could be offered to man. God provided a plan where he can look down at man and say, look, I want you back. I want you to have fellowship with me. Here is the plan here is the way where you and I can fellowship together. Understand, if you know what it means to be saved, if you are saved and you have fellowship with God, understand it's all because of what took place here. God opening up the way. God bridging the gap. It's about a gift. The gift of salvation which cannot be anything but a gift. Because man cannot hope to obtain it any other way. Salvation has to be a gift. You can't work for it because work doesn't take away sin. The uh, Bible says in Romans 3, starting in verse number 10, it says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Now understand, you know what that means? No one is righteous. Right. Not anyone. I like what it says. It emphasizes that. There is none righteous, no, not one. Yeah, but what about? No, not them. Well, what about? No, not them. Well, my grandma. Well, no, not her. Well, my grandpa. Well, no, not him. Well, the preacher. No, not him. And listen, no, not you. No exceptions. None. Says there is none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. There it is again. Well, I'm going to heaven because I'm good. If you're good enough, you're going to get there. Listen, God already looked and you're not good. People, you know, you've heard me say it. People ask, how are you doing? Well, I'm pretty good. Well, you know what? I'm not pretty. And the Bible says there's none good, so I can't be pretty good. But there's none good, no, not one. And then it, it goes on. It says their their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have uttered, they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to, to shed blood. Uh, destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There's no, no fear of God before their eyes. Now, uh, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, but that every mouth may be stopped and that all the world may become guilty before God. Now understand, that's where we're at. We're all guilty before God. Amen. It says in verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. You realize that no matter how many laws you keep, you're still a lawbreaker. Yeah. Because we've broken God's law. Uh, it says, uh, we become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. And now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ and, to all them, and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference for all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. Now, what we see here is simply this. Uh, the Bible tells us there's no way we can do enough good to pay for our sin. Right. 
It doesn't work that way. God looked at it and said, you know what? I want to redeem mankind. I want to bring them back. The problem is they cannot earn it. They can't be good enough. Because the Bible says even our righteousness is this filthy rags. God looks at us. He already told us, you're not righteous. You're not good. We're all sinners. That means we've fallen short of the glory of God. And so God offers us salvation, and in order to do so, it has to be a gift. It has to be something that He gives us because we can't claim it as our own by our own merits. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting light. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, uh, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. It is called redemption, to buy back. It is called reconciliation. That means to be made right. It is called salvation. That means deliverance. It is called the righteousness of God. That is God looking at us and seeing us righteous. His righteousness. Now it's about the new life that we have in Christ Jesus. So not only is the foundation about our salvation, it's about that life that we have after salvation. And that's what we find in this passage. That's what we'll see as we study it out over the next couple of weeks. Listen, it's about a called out people called unto God. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 29, starting in verse number 10, says, Ye stand this day, all of you, before the Lord your God, your captains of your tribes, your elders and your officers with all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives and your stra and the, uh, thy stranger that is in thy camp from the hewer of the wood unto the drawer of the water. Now let me say what he's talking about. This is the book of Deuteronomy. It's after the first generation of Israel that died in the wilderness. The second generation is getting ready to go into the promised land and God is giving them, once, or Moses is giving them once again the law of God. So what the book of Deuteronomy is all about. That, that generation that refused to go in the promised land, they're dead and gone. Mm -hmm. Now Moses is an older man. He was an old man to begin with. Now he's a really old man. <laughs> and, and he's telling the children of Israel, he brings them all together. I mean, listen, they're, they're captains and their elders and their officers and the men and their little ones and their wives and even the strangers that are among them. He brings them all together and says, Thou shouldest... Uh, it says that thou shouldest enter into the covenant of the Lord thy God and into his oath which the Lord thy God maketh with thee this day that he may establish thee today for a people unto himself and that he, that he may be unto thee a God as he hath said unto thee and as he hath sworn unto thy fathers to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob neither with you only do I make this covenant and this oath but with him that standeth here with us this day before the Lord our God and also with him that is not here with us today. You know what he's saying? <coughs> God is here today or God's brought you here today because he wants you to be his people. That's what we're talking about. Deuteronomy chapter 14 verse 2. It says, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. You know what he was saying to Israel? I want you different than everybody else. I see you different than everybody else. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse number 18. And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people, as he hath promised thee, and that thou shouldest keep all his commandments. And so what we're talking about is this. God taking a people, he took Abraham, and he said, Abraham, I'm going to bring a people from you. It went from Abraham to Isaac, Isaac to Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and the children of Israel are the descendants of Jacob, who is a descendant of Abraham. 
And by God said, look, I want you to be my peculiar, my different, my strange people. You're different than everybody else. But it didn't just stop there. Titus chapter 2 verse 14 says, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. You realize that when you got saved, God separated you from everybody else. You are a peculiar person. You may be peculiar in other ways, but you're peculiar to God, which means this. God sees his children different than everyone else. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. Now listen to this. That ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so this is what we're looking at here. God, you know, when Adam and Eve sinned, man was plunged into sin. Man was plunged into darkness. But God looked at it and said, you know what? I want to find a way to get them back. I want to find a way to redeem them. I want to find a way to reclaim them. And so what he did is he said, you know what? I'm going to do that through salvation, but it's going to have to be given to them because they can't earn it. And so God sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross to pay the penalty of sin and through Jesus Christ we can now have access to God and God does and not only that he says I want you for myself I want you to show forth the praises of him you know what God wants God wants us to be what he originally intended man Adam and Eve to be why did God create Adam and Eve in his own image? To bring glory to God. When Adam and Eve sinned, guess what? That image was tarred. That image was changed. But you know, through salvation, we have the ability to be the glory of God. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that the others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. God wants us to live in such a way that we are different than everybody else because he sees us different than everybody else, but he wants us in such a way that when people see us, they see God. But the plan is, it's about changed lives, not just eternity. See, people have this idea, well, I want to make sure I go to heaven. Now, I want to get saved so I go to heaven. I want to live down here any way I want. Listen, God did not save you to leave you the way you are. God saved you to change you. Amen. God saved you to live right. God saved you to do right. He did not save you so that you can go out and live in sin, live any way you want, be guaranteed I'm going to heaven. Listen, if you're saved, you're saved. But God's not going to leave his children living in sin without doing something about it. Very important for us to understand. John chapter 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Listen, when you receive him, you have everlasting life. You have passed from death unto life. 1 John 3, verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. You know what? There's a change that happens in a Christian. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You know, I'm really concerned with people whose profession of faith never changed them. You know, it, it, it's sort of like, uh, you know, we, we want an insurance policy, but we don't want to accept the responsibility. I want an insurance policy, but I don't want to pay the premiums. You know, I, you know, I, I want an insurance policy, but I don't want to have any guidelines in my life. But the Bible says this, if you're in Christ, you're a new creature. God did not save us to leave us alone. Ephesians 2 verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So what we do when we get saved, what God does is this, he creates us in Christ. 
We're a new creature in Christ. What he does is he creates us. We're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto, unto good works. He looks at it and says, you know what? I'm going to use you to do this, and I'm going to use you to do this, and I'm going to use you to do this. Now, we couldn't do it before we got saved because we were separated from God. But God did everything that was required to make it possible. It says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So understand, God already determined how we're supposed to walk, how we're supposed to live. So here is the foundation for this motto, so much the more. This is where it begins. We are born sinners separated from God and God from us. God redeemed us, bought us back through Jesus Christ. We are not to live in the, where we are now to live in this newness of life. But let me add, so much the more. And so now we, we've looked at the foundation of this command. What about the context of the command? See, the, the context of the command, uh, we learned this in college, and I, I've heard it many, many times, a text without a context is just a pretext. A verse without checking out the context is just a thought. So what we need to do is we need to look at where this context rests. We need to look at this text and see what it's, what it's about. And so we find it going all the way back to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. And we find the shadow of the, the, of, of, uh, the real presented in verse number one. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered um, uh, because that the worshipers once purged should have uh, no more conscience of sin. Uh, but in those sacrifices, there is no remember, or there is a remembrance again made of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. So what's it talking about? It's talking about a shadow. It's talking about the, the law of sacrifices and offerings. What it's talking about is the Old Testament. You know, the shadow is the tabernacle. What it's telling us is as you read the law, the law gave all sorts of commands. The law gave us the tabernacle, told how to build the tabernacle. The law gave us the sacrifices. The law gave it the, the feast days and all of that. But what it's telling us is simply this, that these laws, uh, these commands, were just a shadow of things. Um, okay, she may need some guidance back there. Uh, she's... Okay, okay, I guess she's stepping out, okay. It says the shadow is a tab the shadow is the tabernacle and all the finishings. The shadow is the Levitical priesthood. In the Old Testament they lived under the shadow of things. In other words, what it's talking about is this every sacrifice was a picture of Jesus Christ coming. Every one. The feast days were pictures of, of the Christian life and different things in Jesus Christ. Uh, in the Old Testament, they lived under the shadow. Hebrews 8, verse 5, it says, Who served unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For she saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount. Hebrews 9, verse 9, which was a figure for the time uh, then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make uh, him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Hebrews 9, verse 11, but Christ being come uh, an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. And so what we have here is simply this. We have Christ uh, coming as the high priest, but what it tells us here is that in the Old Testament, everything in the Old Testament involved a shadow. In other words, when God met with Moses, God said, Moses, we're going to teach you how to build a tabernacle. And what he did was he showed Moses the tabernacle of heaven. If you look at how the camp was set up, you have in the very middle of the camp, you have the holy place. You have the mercy seat. 
If you go to Revelation chapter 4, you'll see up in heaven the throne in the middle and there's a sea of glass. If you study out how the, the tent was set up or how the, 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 the camp was set up, if you look at how the tabernacle was set up, it's set up exactly as it was pictured to Moses in heaven. And then God gave to Moses the law and God gave to Moses the commands and the sacrifices and every bit of that was a shadow to let them know that one day the Messiah is coming. One day there's going to be a Savior. Now he had the sacrifices and the lambs and the goats and the bulls and the bullocks and all of that, but the Bible tells us that it's not possible that the blood of an animal could save a person. But what it was, it was a shadow of what is yet to come. And that's what we find in the beginning of this chapter. We go down to verses 5 through 9. We see the, the substitution of the shadow with the real thing. It says in verse number 5, Wherefore, when he came, cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me in, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin that hath had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God, uh, above when he saith, sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure in therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ Jesus for once for all. Now let me explain what that's saying. When Jesus came, it was saying this, God was not satisfied with sacrifices. He needed something more than a lamb. He needed something better than a bullock. Now, all those sacrifices were important. All that time, I mean, those decades and those centuries where they offered to God the sacrifices, the Day of Atonement and the feast days and the sin offerings and the peace offerings, they were all important because they pictured what was yet to come. They pictured the day when the Lamb of God would come to take away the sin of the world. Those sacrifices didn't take away any sin, but when Jesus came, uh, God was saying, look, I'm not satisfied with those sacrifices. He gave Jesus Christ Christ a body to be sacrificed as John said behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world it is not possible that unsaved sinful man can be brought bought with the blood of an animal mm -hmm. Hebrews 9 verse 18 the Holy Ghost this signifying uh, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing which was a figure of for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect. See what I'm saying, it's what was needed then, the present time. I mean, understand, God was very serious when he built the tabernacle or had the tabernacle built. You look at it, I mean, understand, only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. If anybody else went in the Holy of Holies, then they would die. Very, very serious. Matter of fact, if you study it out, I mean, they, they had everything was, was organized and whenever the children of Israel would move to another campsite, I mean, the high priest would go in and he would cover up the, the, the mercy seat and he would cover up the, 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 the things, the, 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 the cherubim and he would take care of that and then the other priest would come in and, and only certain ones were allowed to cover up certain things and it was taken down bit by bit and then it was transported and put up exactly right but God expected it to be done in a right way. You know why? It represented a relationship between God and man. And then the offerings, Day of Atonement, the high priest, we got the scapegoats, We've got all the sacrifices and all of that was there. But God looked at it and said, I need something more. But all of that is for now. But one day, the real sacrifice is coming. And that real sacrifice was Jesus Christ. And he came and, and, and through Jesus Christ, what we have is, is the real sacrifice that would take and complete the work of salvation. And it's about the completed work of the high priest 
in the work of salvation. Hebrews 10 verses 11 through 18. And every high priest standeth daily ministering and offering uh, oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. What it's saying is this, that high priest would come in, that priest would come in and every day offer a sacrifice and then go back. And the next day he would come in and offer another sacrifice and go back. Sometimes there was a sacrifice in the morning and a sacrifice in the evening. And then people would bring in their trespass offerings and bring in their sin offerings and bring in their peace offerings. And they would, and, and, and they, they would kill and they would cut up the, the sacrifice they presented to the priest. And they would come in and they would offer it. And then they would come in again and offer it. And when one generation died, their children would take over. And the next generation their children would take over and the next generation their children would take over and understand none of it would take away sin but what it showed was faith in the fact that one day the real sacrifice is going to come one day the real lamb of God is going to come one day the person with the perfect body Jesus Christ will come and he will pay that sacrifice he will die on the cross and that sacrifice will make salvation possible it will make salvation complete Complete. The Bible likens Jesus to the great high priest. <laughs> Understand, every day the priest would go in, they'd get up the next day and do it again and do it again. It reminds me uh, back many, many years ago, they had the Dunkin' Donuts commercial. Remember the donut man and he'd get up in the morning and he'd say time to make the donuts as he's going through the door. And then it's nighttime, he comes in, I made the donuts. And the next phrase, uh, next scene, I, he's at the door, I made, I'm time to make the donuts and I made the donuts. And then the last scene, he opens up the door, he's saying it's time to make the donuts and he opens the door and he's meeting himself coming in saying I made the donuts. The idea was every day, every day. Well, that's how the priest worked. Every day, I've got to go make a sacrifice. And there he lays his head down on the pillow. Do it again. They had it broke down in groups. One, Le one group of Levites would be serving for a period of time. And when their time was over with, they'd go back home and rest. And the next group would come in. Every day, every day, every day, every day. Until the Lamb of God came. See, here's where the good news is. You see, Jesus came and all of that stopped. You know why? The true Lamb of God came. The Bible likens him to the high priest. What he did was this. He came, offered the sacrifice of himself, took the blood, his blood presented it to the throne, and then you know what? This is what the Bible tells us he did. Sat down. You know why? The job's done. No more sacrifices needed. Sins have been paid for. No more animals need to be offered. There's no other sacrifice. There's no other name given among men whereby one must be saved. Right. Now we look at it in, in our situation and in our life today. I mean, listen, we did not live doing the sacrifices. We read about it and we try to study it out and we try to understand it. But, but, but you know, to them, those that every day were waiting for the Messiah to come and for, to, for them to come and look here in Hebrews and realize that, you know what? The Messiah has come. Jesus has come. And you know what? My, my way to heaven has been paid for. It's been secured. All those people that died before Jesus came, they died in faith looking for one day the Messiah would come and their sins were set aside and the Messiah is going to come and He came and He saved them from all those sins. Now they look forward to his coming. We look backward to his coming, but we need to understand that was a pretty big thing to happen. Amen. Jesus paid the way for you to be able to come to him. The culmination of the command. See, now here's where we're going to get. Remember our theme for this coming year is so much the more. Now, 
That phrase and the verses surrounding it is found into this context. What it's saying is, look, we have all of this. Now that should affect our life in such a way that, you know what, it changes. It ought to create in us a desire to serve God more than we've ever served Him before. You see, for every action, there is a corresponding reaction. It says in Hebrews 10, verse 19, having Therefore, having therefore. Uh, have you ever seen what they call a Newton's cradle? I didn't know what it was called until I looked it up, but I remember seeing it on my teacher's desk. And you had a little metal frame and, and you had two poles that were, horizontal, were parallel with each other. And they had a, a fishing line that went down and went through a metal ball and it came up on the other side. And there were five of those hanging next to each other. One, two, three, four, five. And it was neat because you could take one ball here and pull it out and let it go. And it would come down and it would hit this ball. And one ball on this side would swing out, come back and hit it. And then that ball would go like that. You could take two and pull them back this way and let them go. And they would come and hit those and two would go out that side. And then you come back hit and those two. And just keep on going. Just get a little slower each time. You could take three. Now there's five, you take three, you pull it back and it hits, and three will go this way, you come back, three will go that way. You get the idea. Well, see, that's exactly what's happening here. What it means is this, something happened to you which impacted your life in such a way that your life changed. You know, when I got saved, things became different. You know why? My salvation meant something to me. Oh, I was a good kid. I grew up in church. I can never remember there ever being a time in my life when we were not in church. Now, there was a time, and some of you know my story, and we won't go into that, but there was a time, but I don't ever remember that time. I mean, I was little when my mom took us to church, and I grew up in church, and I grew up always knowing, I mean, I grew up hearing the gospel. I could show someone how to be saved when I was in grade school. I had the verses memorized, and my testimony was, you know, I got saved when I was little. I could remember getting baptized, couldn't remember getting saved. It wasn't until before my junior year in high school, somebody approached me and said, uh, an evangelist, I see you raised your hand that you're not saved. It was during a church invitation. And, and it wasn't me. I either had raised my hand at the wrong time or he saw somebody else's hand go up and thought it was mine. Now, I should have known I got saved when I was young. And, and, and I, I told him that. I talked to him afterwards. But that night, I started doubting. I started thinking. I could always remember knowing I was saved, but I could not remember when I got saved. Could not remember getting saved. And so for a whole year, I'm arguing with God. I'm saying, Lord, I, you know, if I wasn't saved before, save me now. If I wasn't saved before, save me now. And I got thinking such crazy things. I'm going to ask him to save me so much, he's not going to do it because he's upset with me. But it wasn't until a year later when I finally admitted to the Lord, Lord, I'm unsaved. I'm on my way to hell. I need you to save me. And you know what? God saved me that night. Wrote my name down in the Lamb's Book of Life. That meant something to me. And that impacted my life. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. That's 1 John 4, 19. And so what it's telling us here is this. You know, there should be things that impact our life in such a way that it changes how we live. That's what we're going to find as we study this out over the next couple of weeks. This idea that, that I no longer have to bring in the animal sacrifices, that, that all that was done has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ and he has come and completed my salvation and he sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. You know what? And he's done that so that I can now come to God. I can now claim him and he can claim me. For every action, there is a corresponding reaction. And then let me say, for every action made, there must be a decision made. Choose you this day whom ye will serve. 
I mean, understand a decision that needs to be made. You know, there's a choice to be made, not just this coming year, but every day of the year. See, the Lord's asking us to make a decision. Choose you this day whom you will serve. I mean, God saved us and that's impacted my life. Now God's looking at us and saying, okay, you know what? Now you need to make a decision. Who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve yourself? Or are you going to serve me? Are you going to go your way or are you going to go my way? Joshua said this, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He said, look, choose who you're going to serve. You can serve the gods from back before the flood or you can serve the God of the Canaanites. And you're living in Canaan, you can serve those gods. But he said, as for me and my house, we're serving God. So you know what? We've, we've got to make a decision. Who am I going to serve? Am I going to serve God or am I going to serve the gods of the world? And then let me say, for every decision, there is a command to be obeyed. Command. It is not about a new commandment, but rather reviving the commands already given. It's not a beginning for most of us, but a renewing of the command we already know. You know, there's some people, they're ready to get saved and this is all going to be new to them. But I'll tell you what, I've been saved since 1974. And you know what I found? I found there's times in my life I get away from the Lord. And so the Lord has to remind me what it's all about. And then I have to make a decision. Am I going to get back to the book? Am I going to get back to the life that God originally designed? So what we're going to see is what God has deemed to be the reaction and the action and the command. The theme is so much the more as you see the day approaching. Why is that important to me? Because you see, he did everything for me. I'm going to heaven because of him. My sins are forgiven because of him. He paid the price. He's given it to me. Now he says, are you going to serve me? We're going to see the commands. We're going to start next week. We're going to look at some things that it tells us in this passage that we ought to do. And then it tells us we need to do it more than ever. Let me give you three thoughts here. The need, it's about the need of the hour. It's never been more necessary or needed than now. If there was ever a time we needed Christians to sell out to God and to serve God, it's today. Number two, it's about the lateness of the hour. It's never been any later than it is now. I mean, understand, I'm older than I've ever been. And tomorrow I'll be older than I've ever been. Pretty profound, isn't it? You realize that we're one day closer to the coming of Christ than we were yesterday. And you realize that you're one day closer to standing before God than you have ever been. The need of the hour has never been more needed. The lateness of the hour has never been as late. And let me say this, our efforts are not sufficient. He says so much the more. You say, well, hey, I'm serving God. Well, the command is this, you need to do it more. have every head bowed, every eye closed. We're going to have an invitation time. This is a time for us to do business with God. We have several here that I don't know. I don't know your walk with God, your relationship with God, but God does. I know this, that God loves you. I know this, that he died on the cross for you. I know this, that he is willing to save you if you'll but call upon him. Uh, for those of us that are saved, let me ask you, are you content with the service you're given now? 
See, 2021 is coming. Five days it'll be here. I want to do more for God than I've ever done. I want to see more done for God than I've ever seen. I wonder, is there someone here that would say, Preacher, if I died right now, I do not know for sure I'd go to heaven. But Preacher, I want to go. Would you pray for me? Would you let me have the honor of just praying? And God will continue touching your heart. Does anyone say, Preacher, I'm not saved. Pray for me. Is there anyone? Okay, let me ask you this, Christian. Are you sold out to him? We have such a blessed truth. Salvation is complete. Because of that, it ought to impact our life. I wonder who say, Preacher, God spoke to my heart today. I just need you to pray that God's will will be done in my life. Would you pray for me? Would you raise your hand? Let me pray for you. There's a couple of hands, a couple more hands. You put your hands down, anyone else. I'll pray in just a moment. I won't embarrass you. I'll just know to pray for you. Dear Lord, we come to you at this time. Lord, I pray that you would touch our hearts. For those that are here and those that are watching on Facebook Live, for those that might be watching later on YouTube, Lord, I pray that you would touch each heart. Lord, there's so much you've done for us, and Lord, I just don't have the ability to present it as well as you do in your word. Lord, I pray it would have an impact in each life. Lord, I pray as we study this out, as we enter into a new year, Lord, that we would do so with a desire to do more than we've ever done. For those that are unsaved, I pray that you would convict their heart. Help them to see that sacrifice that was made for them. And those of us that are saved, Lord, this chapter was written to the saved. This chapter were, was written to people like us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand its truths. Help us to take it with us, study it out. Bless this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all